Okay, thank you so much, Emily. And now I have the pleasure of welcoming Brian Fox Ellis to our um, summit. Brian is an internationally acclaimed author, storyteller, historian, and naturalist. He is the Director of Membership and Outreach for the Illinois Audubon Society, and he is the author of 16 books, including the critically acclaimed Learning from the Land, Teaching Ecology Through Stories and Activities. Welcome, Brian Fox Ellis. Thank you. And uh, I don't know if we're going to go to speaker screen uh, rather than the panel screen. Hush and listen to the earth, to the song she is singing, singing rock and rain and rill from each mountain and valley, calling, calling from her heart. She is calling, oh, 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 calling, calling from her heart. She is calling. That is one of the older songs that we know from about 6,000 years ago in China. I actually had the opportunity to tour China shortly before COVID. <laughs> And uh, while I was singing that song in an elementary school, I was really intrigued that a couple of the teacher's aides actually began singing with me in, uh, in Chinese. I'm not sure if it was uh, Cantonese or what, um, but who's listening to the songs and stories of the earth? What are the songs and stories of the rock and the rill, of mountain and the valley? What is the story of the beaver? We are really blessed here to be in a Zoom room where everybody is uh, listening. And I give you applause, <laughs> even before I go any further, uh, with this idea that we are all voices for the earth. But it begins with deep listening. It begins with listening to the stories of your place listening to the stories of the stream, the forest, the prairie, of your Midwestern homes, or knowing that we have people here from all over the world, from the Netherlands to California, what are the songs and stories of your place? I've made a living as a storyteller for more than 40 years. I have a degree in, in field ecology and, and science education. I did teach for a semester in California. I taught high school. I taught for a year at a Catholic school in inner city Toledo, Ohio. I taught middle school, reading, writing, language, arts, science, and social studies, a real integrated middle school in North Carolina for a year. And I taught graduate courses at uh, Brooklyn Teachers College. But for most of the past 45 years, I've been traveling as a storyteller and teaching. And I hope that this is no longer true. I hope that what I'm about to say, uh, we've blown open the doors and I've opened the wake so others can follow. Um, I am probably one of the only storytellers you will meet who regularly works the Upper Mississippi Floodplain Management Conference circuit. And people in this Zoom room, you are the, one of the few who understand there actually is an Upper Mississippi Floodplain Management Conference circuit. Um, I've spoken at probably five or six of those conferences over the years on the Illinois River, the Missouri River, on the tributaries of the Mississippi. And I, I always laugh when I, I begin with a song. First off, that throws people off a little bit um, because it's a room of usually PhD to scientists. And thank you, Emily, because you answered the question I'm about to ask. I look about this room of, of uh, aquatic ecologists, environmental scientists, civil engineers, a lot of Army Corps people who are doing very important work out in the field. And I say, who is the best engineer? Who's the best aquatic engineer? 
And you always see these people sometimes squirm a little and they look around and maybe they look for their mentor and they smile at the, at the person sitting down the row or the person on their team who's been their personal hero. Who's the best engineer? Who's the best aquatic engineer? Well, you guys know it's the beaver. And again, thank you, Emily, because you provided a lot of the scientific data and the background to show in very specific terms and very measurable, quantifiable evidence the way beavers have shaped the landscape. I live in rural Illinois. If I could show you the view out my back porch, it's cornfields all the way to Kansas. And in Western rural Illinois, the fertility of our land, the fertility of this region, much of it is attributable to the beavers managing the watersheds. In these very flat landscapes, glaciers, you know, took the tops off the hills and filled in the valleys. If we have a flood event, as Emily just eloquently spoke about and showed the evidence, if we have a major rainstorm, now that the beavers are gone, you not only get these big flood events, but you get this deep undercutting of the river valleys. Um, the Edwards River is a stone's throw out my window here, and it's almost impossible to kayak, kayak or canoe, and I know because I've tried, because it's been deeply cut and it is bone dry for a lot of the summer um, with just a trickle even, uh, uh, but we just had two days of the same rain that Emily got. And so now it's just washing away a lot of topsoil. It's uh, offensive to me that a good farmer can lose a couple tons of topsoil every year. And that's not bad. Um, it's terrible. And yet there are farmers around here, especially along the stream edges, who are losing 10 tons of topsoil per acre. Now multiply that out by thousands of acres and it's perfectly understandable that Illinois, where I live, and Iowa, right across the Mississippi, um, are competing every year as to who's gonna add more topsoil to the Mississippi Valley. And if we could restore beavers in the landscape, we would make a huge difference on that. I had the great good fortune to work with Donald Hay, Hay and Associates Engineers. And, and Donald was instrumental in doing the engineering for Hennepin Hopper, one of the larger wetland restoration projects in the Midwest on the upper Illinois River. And then he was also consultant on the Emaquan project um, just south of Peoria, Illinois, the largest wetland restoration. And in both of those environments, beavers have returned on their own. Um, but Donald often loved to talk about how on every little stream and tributary of the Mississippi, we could end the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico if we could restore beavers to their native habitat. Let's flash back in time. Learning the story of your land, landscape genealogy. It's a thesis of my first book, Learning from the Land. Landscape genealogy. What is the history of the place where you live? Take the time right now to think about where you are sitting. Think about those layers of geological and ecological history. Think about the people who have lived here before us. Think about your grandmother or grandfather, if they were early farmers or, or settlers. Think about the, the, the so-called pioneers who came and displaced the indigenous people, the colonizers. Um, think about not just the historic tribes, and we are still present, but think about those prehistoric tribes, the ancient mound builders. Think about the first people, four-legged and creepy crawlies, who walked across or slithered over the land where you now live. If you travel back through history, it gives you data to help make better choices going forward. And if we're gonna talk about beaver, um, part of this story very much begins in Europe. Um, uh, and it is very much a story of hats. The beaver hats of Europe were what fueled the beaver trade and colonization in this land. In Europe, a slightly different species, uh, a rodent that, uh, that does um, live in streams, um, was the source of beaver felt. And so 
the skin um, were harvested, but mainly it was the hair. And if you've worked with beavers, then you know they have this incredibly rich under hair. It's not just the long guard hairs, it's the thick felt underneath. And when you shave that off and you press it into felt, and yes, the hatters were all mad because they worked with toxic chemicals that seeped in through their fingers, and eventually affected. So Mad Hatter is more than a funny phrase in, in uh, Lewis Carroll's book. But they completely erased the beaver from much of Europe. Luckily, jumping forward, because time's a circle, not a line, um, they are rewilding the streams in Scotland. And they are seeing some of the same impacts that Emily was talking about on the streams in Europe. When you return beaver to the landscape, you return the watershed, you return the diversity of life. And actually one other study that Emily reminded me, I, I was at a, a, a conference in the Chicago land area, Chicago Wilderness put together this conference with the Chicago Park Districts. And a young researcher was looking at the diversity of life that lived on a muskrat den. And he had lots of, uh, motions uh, activated cameras with images of like 40 species who hung out on muskrat dens, including endangered birds and beavers passing through. And I'm sure you could flip that around on a beaver den. If you put up a camera, as Emily briefly mentioned, you know, uh, not just birds, but reptiles and amphibians and how they create microhabitat as well as change on the micro on the macro habitat throughout Europe. But when they erased beaver from Europe, they started coming here. And a lot of the early colonization, a lot of the early exploration and pioneers were in search of beaver pelts. And it was beaver trapping that fueled the empires in Europe. King Louis built Versailles with the money he collected from the beaver trade in Canada and the upper Midwest and the Great Lakes region. Just think about that for a moment. If you've been to Versailles, there's a room that is entirely lapis lazuli and they call it the lapis room. And all of that wealth was accumulated from the devastation of beavers here. So we know that in Europe, I also portray uh, Charles Darwin and talk about uh, uh, evolution. And uh, I do that through hats. Every time I change hats, I change characters. But Darwin was not only um, wearing a beaver felt hat, but he talked about um, co-evolution and how creatures adapted to their environment and and how the environment adapted to the creature and how individual species had an impact. And Darwin, way ahead of himself, uh, began to talk about some of the keystone species that now we know beaver are very much one of those keystone species. And so as the Europeans you know, came to America to harvest the beaver, um, there were different relationships. Of course, the British had more of a divide and conquer and the French uh, married in and the French um, relied on building relationships and, and relationships with the native people um, to help harvest those beavers. And of course, there was Catholicism and the missionary and the black robes, and that's a story we don't have time for. But it was the early French who began to explore this territory, looking mostly for beaver. Allez, allez, les voyageurs danser, danser entre la ciel et l'enfer. Allez, allez, les voyageurs danser, les voyageurs danser la vie. From New Orleans, mighty Mississippi, test the northbound paddler to the bone. Great father of the waters, they all call it. Huron, Potawatomi, Illinois, and Dirkoy, Peoria, Sauk, and Fox all call it home. Singing, allez, allez, les voyageurs danser, danser entre la ciel et l'enfer. Allez, allez, les voyageurs danser, les voyageurs danser la vie. That's actually a song that I wrote with the help of a friend of mine, part of a, a much longer musical about the French fur trading epic in, in this region. Um, and there's still lots of French place names. 
But I've also had the great good fortune um, to work with and to do collect oral history uh, from a lot of the native people. And it's intriguing to me that uh, many of the scientific data points that Emily's research ha has brilliantly illuminated and given us uh, really concrete data um, was alluded to in thousand year old stories. If you really want to know the history of this place, talk to the elders who have lived here for a thousand generations. Whatever your cultural origin, you know, talk to the, your neighbors, talk to the people who have lived here for generations because their stories, their, their folklore, even as something as simple as a fable, um, many years ago, um, I was in Maine in, in northeastern United States and Canada uh, for a festival, and I had the great uh, opportunity to spend some time with a, a handful of Mi'kmaq elders and collecting stories. And one of the first stories that I learned, um, I actually it was one of my first experiments with pictographs as well. Um, I did a lot of work at the Field Museum and around the Lewis and Clark Bicentennial. I forgot to mention that I do portray Meriwether Lewis as one of the characters who lives in my head. Um, uh, the Field Museum gets a lot of points. Uh, yes, they committed sins in their early days 100 years ago, but uh, they were one of the pioneers to work with Native elders to hire Native American anthropologists to help to interpret their collection and um, I had the great good fortune to get into the archives when I, as a consultant of the museum, my favorite part of the job is going into the collections and to look through the winter counts. And I do find it hilarious that in some of the winter counts uh, all along the Lewis and Clark trail, um, there's no mention of Lewis and Clark. It wasn't even a blip. These two guys who are kind of lost and asking for directions. Um, but if you look at the pictographs and you look at the stories, you begin to get the depth of complexity of understanding. So I'm going to take just a moment here to, to tell you a, a very short um, origin story from the Malicite, uh, an Algonquin um, language group from northeastern Maine and southeastern Canada. Aglablem. As the drought began to settle upon the land, Aglablem grew thirsty. Aglablem was a huge monster, and Aglablem wanted all the water for himself. And Aglablem gathered this water and held and pounded all of this water. Now, all the creatures who lived downstream grew thirsty. The streams grew dry. Some began to complain. I'm as dry as a fish out of water. Others said, I am a frog in the sun on a hot day. And others said, I am as dry as a beaver who has wandered away from his pond and cannot find his way home. They sent an emissary to, to plead with Aglablem to release the waters so the people, they could have life. And Aglablem, <laughs> he laughed, he scoffed, and he gave them a little flick of water, not enough to replace the tear that was shed. And so another went, and he, he pleaded, but he was more firm and resolute. Aglablem, the water is not yours. The water belongs to all. The water belongs to all. Please release the impounded water. Give the water back to the land. <laughs> Aglablem, he laughed again and he gave another little flick of water. And then he lay down and he bathed in this huge pool. And as he lay there floating, this person began to gnaw on a tree. This one began to chew at the root, at the trunk of a rather large tree. And he quietly, carefully chewed all the way around and around and around until this huge tree fell, sploosh onto Aglablem and held him there under the water. And with the falling of that tree, the water was released. And the water flowed down that huge river. The trunk of the tree became the St. John River. And the branches of the tree became its many tributaries. And like the leaves on the tree, there were a thousand little ponds filled with water. 
And those who complained, I am as dry as a fish, became a fish and swam upstream. And those who whined, I am as dry as a frog on a sunny day, they let into the stream, transformed to frogs, they swam away. And those who said, I am as dry as a beaver, they became beavers. And they swam up that stream, up those tributaries, and into those pools. They built small dams to impound the water to hold it back so that the fish and the frogs could thrive. And though, yes, it is true that the beaver cuts down a tree now and then, but by increasing the surface water, water in the water table, a tree ironically thrives thanks to the beaver. And I hope Emily would affirm this, but when the beavers move in, especially to the dry streams, the trees grow more plentiful. And that is the story of Agla Blem from long ago. Let's just take a moment with that one short story. And even though, you know, we might call it a, a fable, a work of fiction, I believe that that story embodies a lot of deeper truths about the relationships of a people to their homeland, about the relationships between frogs and fish and turtles, about the ways that beaver have an impact on the landscape. Um, moving quickly, because yes, I have time. One more really short fable. And I, waste, I will say this one is from an older book. It was one of the first gifts that I received as a storyteller. It's called uh, Wigwam Evenings, Sioux Folk Tales Retold by Charles Eastman and his and his wife, Elaine Eastman. Um, and this version, which was given to me more recently, uh, has a forward by Lewis Erdich. And I do want to uh, paraphrase. In the introduction, she talks about how these simple fables were told by every culture around the world. Aesop's fables, if you do the research, um, they are actually from ancient Greece. That's where they were written down. But Aesop, means the slave. And you can find some of these stories in Northern Africa and the Panchantantra from ancient India, 7,000 years old. Uh, you'll find echoes of these simple fables. I will also acknowledge that there are much longer, more complicated stories that A, I don't have time to tell, and B, should not be told outside of the appropriate setting or ceremony by the person who is authorized to tell those stories. I chose these two fables because they are more than public domain. They are stories that were shared with me uh, with the intention that uh, I could share them and you could share them broadly too. The Eagle and the Beaver. I'm sure you've seen it. Imagine a clear blue cerulean sky, not a single cloud. And if you look closely, there's a little black speck and it's growing larger and larger, moving swiftly towards you, towards the earth, towards the shore of a broad stream. And there on that shore is an old beaver woman and beaver woman is eating at the soft green bark of a poplar. And though beaver woman is eating gnawing, she is paying attention. She sees that dot grow larger. She hears that whir of wind and wings and slips into the water just in time. One of the advantages of a deeper beaver pool is a place to hide from such predators. The eagle swoops down and sullen, disappointed, lands in a dead snag and watches, hoping. It is a while before the beaver pokes out her nose. She sees that eagle and she scolds him. Who do you think you are, disturbing an old woman while she is trying to eat? Ah, uh, I am hungry, says the eagle. Oh, yes. You would gladly prey on a grandmother who not only is trying to chop down this tree to feed her family, but cares for the creatures around her. Oh, I am a warrior, a hunter. I am not a grandma like you. Oh, yes, she says. 
There are some who are born to be troublemakers, but you could learn much profit from the example that I set here. I am harvesting food, yes, but I'm also creating a home for my family. And when I create this home, it ripples out to benefit all that live here in my community. And she says, you, you will go hungry, but we shall thrive as she dives down and swims away. Pride alone does not fill a belly. It was the eagle who went hungry that day. Again, a very simple fable. You know, what did that take? About three minutes to tell? But within these simple stories is a route to environmental awareness, an acknowledgement of the relationships between predator prey and, and uh, habitat reform. And, and if you take the time to learn the stories of your place, Regardless of your race or ancestry, and race is a concept that doesn't really exist genetically. I also play Gregor Mendel. <laughs> we all share so many genes. Culture is what's important. Who are your people? Who raised you? What are the stories of your great-great-grandmothers? Those are the important stories we should learn and tell. But what is the culture of the land we also inhabit? And who knows that land better than the cultures who have lived here for thousands of years? So I'd, I'd like to end by taking just a couple of minutes to challenge you, because we're going to go to lunch after the Q&A, um, to begin to do the research on your landscape, to become a landscape genealogist, to look at the old plat maps of who lived there before you. My wife and I are currently house hunting, and, uh, and yeah, I want to look at the, the map of the city, get to know the neighborhood, what's the watershed, where's the closest creek, um, you know, look at the soils. Was this a prairie or a forest? And that will determine what I plant in my yard, in my garden, am I, am I restoring or conserving or recreating what used to be there. I do a lot of landscape uh, restoration as part of my job with the Illinois Audubon Society, but it starts with soil analysis. You don't really want to plant prairie where there used to be a forest because you'll be fighting trees the whole time. And, and you don't want to plant a forest where there used to be a prairie because uh, it will be a struggle for those trees. What are the wetland soils? Where can we store those wetlands? Look at the geological layers of history, the ancient sea bottom or the uh, plate tectonics and uplift. Look at the geological layers, but also look at the cultural layers. Look at the impact, positive and negative, of your parents and grandparents, the farmer that maybe you bought the plot from, or the great-great-grandfather of the person who first settled there. Um, Look at the ones who came before us. Look at the cultural maps, as well as the geological maps. Take the time to listen. And ending on this note, the most important listening we can do is on the land itself. As Aldo Leopold so eloquently wrote, or uh, Sigurd Olson from further north in Minnesota, find that listening point to go out uh, into uh, you know your shack your backyard or maybe just the patio outside your apartment and spend time listening to the stories of the land and listening to the stories of the beaver and when you take the time to quietly listen take the time to steep yourself in those ancient tales you can become a voice for the forest, the wetland, the prairie. You can be a voice for the endangered species that once dwelled there and helped to build the habitat to restore them. You can be a voice for the earth itself, a voice for the beaver. Hush and listen to the earth, to the song she is singing, singing rock and rain and rill from each mountain and valley, calling, calling from her heart.
she is calling. Thank you. Thank you for listening. It's more fun live in the room when I can see your faces and get you to sing along and teach you the song. I tried to do sing along a few times on Zoom and it doesn't work because of the delay. <laughs> questions. Uh, hi, Brian, I'm just checking in. We have some interesting questions in the Q&A, some of which um, we'll hold off on asking. Um, I just thought as the, um, as your, as part of your role for the Illinois Audubon Society, what do you see in terms of bird populations and beaver ponds? Oh, th that's a great question. Um, and, and I will, uh, I wish I had the paper to cite, um, but it was really intriguing. There was this young man, um, you know, doing his, I think his, uh, you know, his, his uh, doctoral research on muskrat mounds in, uh, in Big Marsh on the south side of Chicago. And the presentation was at Big Marsh. So it was really great to be in the space where this story took place. And he, he put up cameras and he watched what inhabited or visited. And the diversity of bird life was amazing because Illinois Audubon Society is also funding. And I, I had some hands-on field work at Big Marsh this year um, with black crown night herons in particular. And uh, so this is kind of extrapolation from that, but I would bet hard cash money that when beaver ponds come in, the bird diversity almost immediately responds, that they create both micro habitats and, and creating varying depths, which you know some of the shorebirds prefer shallower water, some of the wading birds prefer deeper water, creating food sources for those uh, wading birds and for those shorebirds, um, for you know red-winged blackbirds and and uh, yellow-headed blackbirds, the common ones. I'm sure their numbers go up as well. I don't have specific data to cite. Um, it's mostly anecdotal. But one of the things Illinois Audubon Society is involved in is wetlands restoration. Um, we we um, are real excited to announce it's public now, so I, I couldn't talk about it for nearly a year. Um, we helped to buy a thousand acres just outside of Chicago, Tamarack Farms, and it's not open to the public yet, but I've been in there taking pictures and I wrote an article for the magazine. That's my primary job. I'm a science communicator, so I'm the editor of Illinois Audubon Magazine. That's uh, I was self-employed for 42 years, turned 60 and decided to see what it's like to have a day job. Um, so I do get to edit articles about your question. Um, and the short answer is when you restore wetlands, when beavers are involved in the process, they are the keystone species that add to the diversity overall. And um, I was just thinking about, you know, this whole question of ecological amnesia, how we, we don't yes. really understand what our landscape looked like prior to European settlement. But do you are you aware of like exactly what happened when when the trappers started coming through our Midwest region? Like, can you kind of walk us through what would have happened? Um, you know, two or three times, <laughs> I my head was thinking ecological amnesia during my presentation. That is one of my favorite phrases, Rachel. Thank you for bringing it up, um, because I do think you know even talking to uh, to to you know, kids and grandkids, now that I have some, they don't have any idea about like driving home last night, bug splatter on a windshield. It has virtually disappeared around cornfields in Western rural Illinois. And having this ecological amnesia of knowing what the beaver impact was, uh, you have to go back more generations than we have uh, knowledge of. And looking at one of the other questions, um, from Marlene in Iowa, looking at the at the old stories is one of the ways that you fill in those blanks and telling the old stories because even though when I was admittedly doing uh, some research for this presentation, I, I, I did a quick uh, search online about beaver tales. There are many beaver stories through many cultures, which says that beavers lived everywhere, but most of them overlap on the same few, uh, how beaver got a flattened tail. And if you search, you can find a version of that. Um, but I think ecological amnesia is a very important issue. So real quickly, because I don't have an hour and I could, because I, I wrote a whole show about this, uh, uh, the French voyageurs, 
So there's another question. Did Native people quickly abandon their philosophy of sustainable harvest when the fur traders arrived? And the short answer is no. Um, when the French fur, trader, fur traders arrived, there was an increase in harvest. But it wasn't until later when Lewis and Clark opened the Missouri and the Astor fur trade came in that they completely wiped out the beaver. And so, you know, Native people tend to live, we tend to live in more in harmony and we restore and we take limits. Like one of the longer beaver tales I didn't have time to tell, um, talks about putting every bone back. Um, so that the beavers return. And it's, you know, the beaver gives us fur and life and the tail in particular um, is delicious. And yeah, I was a trapper when I was young. Um, and I did make some income selling fur uh, to uh, to traders. Um, but that that's the modern fur trade industry, which is real different. <laughs> um, uh, but then when the Astor fur trading empire came in and the Hudson Bay uh, company came in, uh, that's when it went from sustainable to over harvest to complete depletion. And the complete depletion actually didn't happen until relatively recently. The late 1800s, beaver were common in Illinois. I don't have an exact date, but the early 1900s is when they were virtually extirpated from the state. And it's only recently that they've begun to come back and working with Donald Hay, you know, we've seen how one beaver dam on a small stream um, reduces that undercut, returns the floodplain, returns water to the landscape, changes the water table, as Emily's research highlighted. Um, so it is about well, peeling back those layers. We do have to wrap up, but thank you so much, Brian. And um, I know you'll be answering questions in the chat while we go on to our next thing. Yeah, and next is lunch. So if I could give people a little lunch homework, take some time to think about the stories of your landscape. Be a voice for the beaver. What stories could you tell? Um, and one a one sentence version. I used to live on a lake that in a board meeting, they had a conversation about a silt problem in the lake. And then the next agenda item was they wanted to trap beavers who were cutting down expensive trees. <laughs> right. It's like, duh, we've all got those kinds of stories. So my homework assignment during lunch is, what are the stories you have and how can you tell that story in more than one sentence to help illuminate right. some of the ideas we're struggling with? Thank you.